Hello. Okay. <laughs> that was a little loud. We'll get started in just a moment. Hmm? I was allowed to travel. Yes. I'm surprised that even Zoom not allowing me to travel. Dick's yeah. been letting us travel for it's been a while since yeah. I've lowered that. So I don't know. Who knows with them? Okay. All right. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to session H2 on data access, governance, and ethics. Um, my name is Sophia Lafferty Hess, and I'll be chairing this session today. Um, I do want to note that our original chair, Robin Rice, had some travel woes. So um, we are kind of quickly switching things up. And um, so I want to just ask for you to bear with us um, as we kind of make some adjustments today. Um, anyways, I would like to welcome our first speaker today, Steve McCracken. I probably said that incorrectly, so, <laughs> okay. And he will be presenting on the Cadre 5 Safes framework. Um, Steve is the director and manager of the Australian Data Archive at the Australian National University, where he is responsible for the daily operations and technical and strategic development of the data archive. He has high-level expertise in survey methodology and data archiving and has been actively involved in development and application of survey research methodology and technology over 15 years in the Australian university sector. Steve holds a PhD in industrial relations from Deakin University, as well as a graduate diploma in management information systems and a bachelor of commerce with honors from Monash University. He has research interests in data management and archiving, community and social attitude surveys, organizational surveys, new data collection methods, including web and mobile phone survey techniques, and reprodu reproducible research methods. Um, Steve has been involved in various professional associations in survey research and data archiving over the last 20 years, including chairing the executive committee of the DDI and teaching with the Australian Consortium for Socialand Political Research and the executive committee roles with the International Federation of Data Organizations and CoData. So um, thank you for joining us, Steve. Oh. I must remember to send the short version of my bio. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so yes, I'm Steve McKechnie and I'm as I say, based at the, the Australian National University in Canberra. And um, I'm gonna talk today, as I say, for, for those who, might have seen, uh, say, I, I've just spoken about 15 minutes ago about the, the next stage of this project. Let's say we're a bit back to front in the ordering um, uh, uh, in terms of these presentations. But this is sort of feedback on the first stage of um, what is a, a three year project for supporting uh, improved access to research data in the social sciences uh, in Australia. So um, the, the CADRE project stands for Coordinated Access to Data Researchers and Environments, uh, and it's supported by um, a, a large... Ooh, come on, let's get the progress going. Yep, got it. It's all right. Um, a, a, a large grant from, um, or actually a, 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 a co-partnering contribution from uh, our Federal Department of Education through an organisation known as the Australian Research Data Commons, which is one of the, uh, the there's the Australian partner in the uh, Research Data Alliance for those who are familiar with it. So I'm going to talk to uh, today, and I think we've got about 20 minutes, Sophia, is that right? We have three. Yep. Yep. Okay. I, I had to cut short a bit of the, the last presentation, so I'm just going to figure out where I'm going. A um, bit about the project itself and, and what we're trying to do. Uh, and then a, a bit about the framework, the, the conceptual framework we've developed for this project, which is based around the, the five safes model for sensitive data access that um, as I say, has been talked about a bit here at um, uh, here at ISIS and has its origins with um, our Office of National Statistics and UK Data Service colleagues. Um, we're going to talk a bit about how we've gone about thinking about that in, uh, in application to the Australian case, uh, and then, uh, say, uh, my previous um, uh, presentation talked about the information model we developed as a result of that. So this is really a reflection on um, the, 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 the conceptual framework we're trying to use to, to, to underpin the project itself. Okay, so there's a context for this. Um, uh, so why why the Cadre project actually developed? Um, it 
in Australia. Um, 2018-19, we had fairly active in, uh, involvement in understanding um, how do we improve access, particularly to government data in Australia. Um, so through the uh, a group called the Productivity Commission, which is a sort of a major research and evaluation arm of the, our federal government, um, there was a, a major uh, report commission, six to 700 pages long, had a look at methods for improving data access um, uh, in Australia. And this and a series of, of, of activities that actually revolved from that, including a national office of the data commissioner. So established you know, a, 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 a regulatory and, and support agency for improving access uh, alongside um, what something that passed just last month, um, a, a new legislative framework for supporting you know, that access as well. Known as the, the DAD Act, or if you're you know if you're, you're reading closely, it would be the data. But we have it's going to be the Data Act is how, probably how it'll be referred to because we have you know a bit of recursion in there. Okay, so a new legislative framework. This is the first time in the world that it's actually, it's actually been embedded in you know national policy. You know, there's there's plenty of framework. You know, it's been used in lots and lots of places, but we've actually legislated it through as a set of principles. Um, but the big challenge of, of the five safes is, is it's a principles-based framework, which means what when I say safe people, what do I mean? When I say safe projects, what do I actually mean? Um, so our project is really to, to turn, turn that around a bit. It's not tied just to focusing on government data. We are interested in research and administrative and government data collections. Um, but how do we actually operationalize what those different you know, those five states actually mean? I'll come back to those for those who may not be familiar with it. And particularly how to apply it in multiple circumstances, that so quantitative and qualitative social science research data uh, in this case, uh, and even you know, other forms of data collections as well. I've actually been on a call at 6 a.m. this morning talking about indigenous data access in Australia and thinking a little bit about how, you know, how those modes might work. So how do we operationalize and eventually how do we use that information to support decision making for data custodians and actually for researchers as well? How do we you know, improve and streamline the process of managing access to data? Um, uh, and so, as I've said uh, previously, this is actually a metadata oriented project. This is not a, a process for saying, you know, we're going to move data from here to there. This is a process for saying, how do we agree this is where, you know, this is a, an approved project and provide an authority structure for that movement to actually occur, as one example. So um, the, the, the project itself. Um, aims to operationalize the five safe framework and establish a, a shared and distributed sensitive data access management platform for the social sciences and related disciplines. Um, and it, as I say, it, it's funded through uh, the ARDC um, and it, it, as I say, it, it picks up on the, the five safe framework there. And there's a couple of links to some of the, the underlying publications. We have a project website. Um, Andre5safe.org.au. So if you want to track what we're doing over time, say so that's that's you you can certainly get in there and have a look at some of the the activity we've 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 got, and that includes a link to the uh, the framework I'm going to talk about today. Um, we also have a, a, a range of partners in the project itself, um, and this this is an important part of the, the combination. What we try to do with this, there are eleven partners uh, in the in the project. And they're drawn broadly from three areas. One's from universities. There are five universities involved, uh, as I say, because we're both consumers and producers of data. Um, there are three uh, government agencies, uh, the, oh, sorry, the Institute of Health and Welfare and the Institute of Family Studies. Um, uh, and I have, as I say, the Department of Social Services have an advisory role into this as well, which is one of our policy agencies. But the, these two are particularly research, you know, government research institutes in Australia and often responsible for both production and, and support of um, sensitive data. Uh, and then we have what we would call e in Australia e-research providers, those who are providing infrastructure services and, and, and platforms. Um, so Arnet it provides our national re uh, research network um, and connections into, uh, uh, it's actually, that, for example, they're engaging with the EOSC um, technology platforms and they've actually you know, uh, involved there. They're also providing you know, the underlying network layer, our national access federation provider, AAF, um, which connects us into a lot of authority and, you know, and, and access control. Uh, and then uh, Orange, a national spatial data um, uh, agency supported under the, our national uh, infrastructure strategy. We have a, an overarching strategy 
which I'll touch on here, uh, known as Encris, which is kind of our equivalent of the um, the ESFRI uh, European framework. And there are quite a lot of parallels and uh, and connections between the two. But the Encris the strategy, National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, sets the overarching framework for investments in Australian research infrastructure. Uh, and then Australian Research Data Commons is the agency, one of, one of those funded agencies under the NCRIS program, responsible particularly for data and data management um, uh, in Australia, and they're our major partner in this. So I say a significant proportion of the amount of money in, uh, contributors is what $1.9 million from through Department of Education through ARDC, matching investments actually from the, um, uh, the, the project partners as well. There's a one-to-one -one matching requirement um, here for this. So a lot of time and you know, effort and, and, and investment involved in this program. I'm also obliged to share this slide you know, for as part of the funding itself. So, yeah, you know, I've ticked my box there. Okay, so what are some of the outcomes we're looking for from the from from the cadre project itself? A shared conceptual framework, some information exchange protocols. So those are the two presentations I'm giving here at the conference. So as I say, the, the morning session talked about the, the exchange protocols. Here's we're talking about the framework itself. Work later on the year is around the data access management platform um, and some pilot integrations with some of those services, both the universities uh, and some of the, the e-research infrastructure providers. Okay. Um, and then some a, a, a significant training and engagement program as well. And if you see anyone, you know, sort of posting on Twitter, there's a team back in Australia, you know, actively working in the Twitter accounts at the moment. So they're doing their job. Um, but as I say, a big training program that's also associated with that, and that's been the theme at this conference as well. So we, so we do have a, an interesting engagement there. Okay, the framework itself, um, we published in December last year. This, this is, the, what the framework fundamentally is, is it takes you know, a, a review of the existing five safe academic and, uh, and policy literature that exists and tries to provide a review of that. Uh, it, does it, it, in a sense, looks at its, it, its in, uh, implementation and applicability in the Australian context, and also tries to, you know, to address that question of its practicality. So when we start to think about these things in practice, what are the additional implications? And now uh, our, our, we have a conceptual working group whose role it was actually to say, well, you know, when we talk about these things on the ground, from an academic and from a government agency point of view, what, what would we would be actually be looking for to, set, to allow us to say, well, these are the sorts of things we'd actually be interested in knowing you know, on the ground to make those assessments about safe people, safe persons. And we didn't take the assumption that there was one definition of these things either. You know, as I say, that, that was very clear early on that you know, we, were, we weren't, weren't going to come to a shared understanding of this is a safe person and this is not. It's contextually driven and there's a lot of interactions between the different parts. So what is the inter so uh, our driver here was what's the information you might need for you to make your own judgment based upon the business rules you're going to establish around your particular collection. You know, trying to trying to come to one definition just wasn't wasn't going to work, and it, it, it actually, in the context of how this plays out, it does it doesn't make sense to do it that way. Okay, in case you weren't aware, what are the five safes themselves? Now there's this is you know uh, two versions: Felix Ritchie um, uh, and uh, Richard Welkton, if he's in the ether here somewhere, um, there's probably online there, uh, and Tanvi Desai, uh, and then other work that was done at, at UKDS um, have, have published on uh, on this. The Office of the National Data Commissioner in Australia has kind of provided their version of this as well. So, so how they frame that question of what is each of these, but fundamentally, safe projects, people, data, settings, and outputs are the, the five elements of what is essentially a risk management framework. How do we make judgments upon each of these things? The other, so, you know, so we need to know information about each of those. The other key elements, which I find really, really quite helpful is you have to think of them both jointly and severably. So they, you know, uh, say we assess each one of them kind of in turn, but we also have to think about if this, then that, you know, and a good example of that is if I'm an academic researcher, am I necessarily safe? If I'm an academic researcher who's doing a commercially funded project, is that safe or not? So we, we do have to think about the joint, you know, assessment of these, just as a, as a simple example. Um, so, you know, to, uh, and this is just a kind of a summary of what are the, the, the key things we were trying to identify as we went through. Fundamentally, 
there, there was consensus around, you know, well, reasonably well understood as principles. There was very much inconsistency in, in the application in particular circumstances. If I went from agency to agency, I, you know, I would find different things or from researcher to researcher. People have different priorities for what they're, you know, they're, they're interested in there. Uh, and they have different, you know, potentially legislative arrangements. Um, so, you know, I often talk to several government agencies and I move from one to the next. They want to know what others are doing, but they also have to be, you know, conscious of their own legislative and regulatory frameworks that, you know, under which, you know, uh, they work. So requirements, particularly, you know, for example, around safe projects would be diverse across the cadre communities. And this held for, you know, each of the five safes. So what we were trying to do was identify indicators of interest for the potential information requirements. And then that, that's it. And then we kind of articulated those in the conceptual framework. Uh, and the framework itself goes, works through that articulation, but it also works through a series of worked examples from some of the project partners as to how they think about, you know, some of these, you know, some of these information requirements and use cases. Okay. The, let's say, the, 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 so the outcomes of the framework itself, you know, what are the key things we were finding through there? Well, essentially the overall approach itself, we've worked through, you know, uh, the, how, we, how we're thinking about, you know, the practical implementation of those. There's a specifically an interest on qualitative data. Um, so how do, we, how do we apply the five safes to the, the qualitative data collections um, based upon work by colleagues at University of Melbourne, uh, Julie McLeod, uh, Kate O'Connor and Nicole Davis were, were saying, well, if you think about you know, uh, qualitative data collections, well, what, you know, what parameters might vary? What are the particular needs that exist, that exist there? What extensions might be needed? You know, what's missing from the five-safe framework? Um, where do we see those joint and several applications of the five safes? And then what are the information and data models we might want to apply? Where, where can we get, you know, are there existing implementations that, that might be useful for us? And I'm going to, quick pointer, um, the Elixir work that's happening with the, uh, is actually there's, we're picking up some of the work out of that program uh, as one of our, you know, sort of our exemplars, along with some work from ICPSR and uh, alongside that work from George Alter um, that he's been doing since um, uh, he's uh, stepped down directing ICPSR. Okay, so some of the qualitative data implications, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just quickly flash them up there. We have to think about small data, um, it's how do we deal with the context and managing, you know, contextually rich information. Um, we might have to rethink a little bit about um, knowledge practices, um, it, you know, what are the ethics implications of those. Um, but, you know, when you start thinking about um, data access for qualitative data, how do we carry the context along with it? And how does, what interaction does that have with the privacy requirements that come with it as well? You know, cards on the table, I think there's a very interesting application of um, the use of safe settings for analysis of qualitative data. Um, you know, so you can, you know, how do we deal with anonymization in qualitative data? Is that actually a good thing to do? Well, what if we switch, you know, we think about the, that in the context of the five safes and say, maybe we don't anonymize. What are the implications of that? You know, where do we put it? How do we manage the settings? So we, we have different levers we can pull. Um, you know, that, that statement I'm making obviously has implications as well, but that, you know, you can think about how you might use this in that, in that context. The two extensions we felt we particularly needed were really around organizations and groups. Um, so the five safes um, has in, in, implicitly a recognition of organization. Somewhat, you know, a safe person works in a given organization. In practice, most of the legal and regulatory frameworks that, that underpin your access to, to data depend upon you working for a given organization. So it's the, in, in the, the Australian legislative case, your organization will be approved for allowing to apply for data before you as an individual researcher will be able to get access. So an organization actually should be a first class object in this system is, you know, make that explicit and make the roles that you have. Researchers will often work for more than one organization and they will organization shop around their affiliations to enable access as well. It's, you know, um, so how do we actually represent that effectively? Um, similarly, groups, um, most, uh, there's not explicit recognition of groups, but a lot of group organization becomes critically important in actually managing, particularly combinations of people on, you know, working on a project, combination of projects in a research program, combinations of data in a data linkage, you know, grouping structures matter and they're not actually particularly well represented. And then the access controls often don't deal with the fact that those groups can extend across organizations. We don't do very well. I work here and my other partner organization works there. How do you actually deal, you know, outside of a, an organizational structure, making someone affiliate of something? How, do we, how are we going to deal with that? 
and you know, that that was you know part of our thinking there. We worked through, and I, I won't go through each of them, but we worked through some you know some particular interactive examples of where you're making joint assessments across the five safes. Uh, and they, they say there's some some worked examples there, but particularly, you know, I, I've given you know the example of a researcher working on commercial research is you know just just one of those. But there is a series of you know points that we're identifying that that joint assessment. Um, but as I say, so we, we've kind of framed out where we think the 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 the, uh, the requirements actually go. There, the last thing we wanted to do in the project uh, in the framework itself is say, well, are there examples out there that we could always start to pick up on? And this is where as I say we we started looking you know, nationally and internationally. Partly we relied upon the the work that was coming out of the access providers. So Australian Access Federation have been you know invaluable here. We already do collect a lot of information, and it comes through our single sign on. You know, as a starting point, it's not enough. And for the purposes of particular ages, it's certainly not enough, but it's a starting point and it's something we can attach things to. Um, what about thinking about safe projects? Um, and where this is where, let's say, the Elixir project, um, particularly uh, the Global Alliance for Genomic Health, which is a part of that program, has been thinking about describing different forms of data, you know, sorts of data use. Now, it's particularly for applying in, you know, the, the biosciences, but a lot of these don't turn out to be particularly, you know, specific to the biosciences. We think we can take this ontology, extend it in certain directions, and extrapolate the generic versus the, the biospecific. So the way this, this particular model works is, you know, you start with the idea that there might be no restrictions. Way of, you know, so if you define something as no restrictions, well, you can move it as open data potentially. If it's been defined as general research use, well, now you've got a way of saying, is it commercial, non-commercial, you know, researchers or not? So you can start matching intended users and applications to, you know, agreed usages. And that's really what we're trying to bring together uh, in the process here. When you get into the health space, you start thinking about disease specific models and, you know, particular health, you know, health applications and particular um, case, cases of disease. So they work their way down you know, forms of cancer, for example, and they work down to the level of the individual um, uh, clinical case, you know, so, uh, yeah. Uh, but there are a series of non, you know, that, that are non-domain specific. Uh, and on the right-hand side, there's actually a really quite, you know, a, a useful starting point for describing. Do you need to provide a publication? Do you need ethics approval? Are there geographic restrictions? And, you know, um, we have a, a consideration in Australia where certain data can't leave Australia. Now, if you can define you must be resident in Australia or you must be an Australian citizen, for example, you've got a means for actually, again, this is this is the requirement. This is the application I might. Do these things to you know, align or not? Agree, disagree. You can streamline the access process as a result. Um, so we did a profile of those and uh, say, uh, with a couple of our, one longitudinal study, one of our standard, uh, this is our version, uh, contribution to the IWSP, uh, and you can map these out fairly well, and they do map reasonably well to some of the five safes. It's also the case and I, uh, um, that you can start thinking about putting identifiers against, you know, the five safes as well. So this is a slide which, and I say, there's lots of things in yellow question marks here that we have to agree on, but there is a starting point here for saying we have both an information model, a way of describing what does a custodian require, and a way of thinking about where does an applicant actually need to provide the information source from, where we can start looking at a matching model to come to the point, and this is my last slide, um, where we can, you know, we're not, we're not automating data access here, but we can streamline the process and progressively know what, what do we know about people? What do we know about the projects they're doing? What do we know about their settings? Align that with this is the intent on which the data is being shared. So we can harmonize and streamline that process of access effectively. And this comes again out of the GUO project from the, the, the Elixir team is they're looking to do this in an automated way on a case by case basis. We're not gonna try and do that, but you know, it is, you know, people are thinking about how do we make this much more machine actionable than we have in the past. And that I'll leave that as my final. Steve. I, 
have a question. I'm, mm-hmm. I'd just be interested in you saying a little bit more about how you guys are thinking about the approach for qualitative data. You said there was kind of mm-hmm. more to say there. And um, I think it's a very interesting topic because it does have some very unique kind of use cases and needs. Yep. So um, I don't know if you have more you wanted to add. There. Um, there's a whole paper. So, okay. okay. So there's a first draft of actually, you know, so um, uh, Julian uh, and the team have actually had a first run at actually what do they think of the implications there they've, and what they've done is gone an assessment of you know what are some of the research training what are some of the ethics implications what are some of the uh, epistemological considerations that are, you know that are relevant here now so i i won't talk to those because as i say i'm not as qualified as they are to do so but their thinking actually has been articulated and i either we've we've got it close to publication but in the near you know, or it's you know, it's it's about to be published um as a as a draft for comment fundamentally so i I'll, that'll be posted on the website and i'll encourage you know people to look at that and say that's probably the next couple of months all right we have a question okay thank you I, I may have missed this but is it in scope as well to have like a researcher's research data made available through this five states framework and who would be doing the evaluation if it's on the researcher's data um, the research, so it, that that's actually the point, it, okay. which is to say, there's no reason why this couldn't be someone else getting access to a researcher's data, and that's right. actually the framework that okay. are um, that the qualitative folks they have, yeah. You know, so they have deposited our data with the ADA, mm-hmm. and we've worked with them on you know managing the access process. But you know, when it comes down to it, okay, how do we move from having an ad hoc judgment to something that's a bit more consistent there? So the th- the thing we think is really quite useful is that the, the five states themselves doesn't necess- necessitate, you know, government being the custodian of data here. Uh, and this is actually the point I was making in the right. Indigenous um, uh, meeting this morning is imagine, you know, you, you turn this around, which is governments want access to data from an Indigenous community. Well, okay, hang on a minute. How, how well do you comply with the sorts of expectations that actually come along here as well, particularly around, is this, a, you know, is this project consistent with, you know, the, the, the standards and expectations that a particular community might have established. So research, you know, it, you, it's, a, it's a relationship between a custodian and a, you know, a, a, an, an applicant for data, but we don't define at all who those, you know, those two parties are at the end of the, the process or the multiple parties that might get either into that process. Thanks. One other question? Actually, a brief comment just to connect connect dot so richard richard welpton at, at ukri i guess now and yep. felix ritchie or organized a working group on the qualitative data in five safes framework and it's met a few times it's published a blog i'm in it too mm. so we're on parallel you know parallel universes that need to converge soon but there there is progress i think happening yeah. in this area so felix should have told me felix is actually on our advisory group um so so we have an international advisory group in fact to Make sure we do connect into you know the, uh, these different. So we have from colleagues from the US, UK, uh, New Zealand, um, and we, we'd like to get into continental Europe. The question was where and how, um, uh, but certainly to make sure we do try and connect the dots between those sorts of discussions. All right. Well, um, join me in thanking Steve, and we may have some extra time at the end for additional questions. Um, we we have only two more presentations, so thank you. Thanks so much. Give me just a moment to try to transition. Kelly, are you online still? Oh, I see you. I see you. (laughs) Okay, Kelly, I have made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen now.
And if you could try to unmute and speak and let's see if your microphone's working. Actually, could you stop sharing for just a moment, Kelly? I've got to move things around. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, now start sharing and try to talk. I'm not, we're not hearing you if you're speaking now. Yeah, your are you, microphone. Oh. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, now we okay. can hear you. Okay, wonderful. That's very exciting. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a conference without some logistical technicality, right? <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Um, oh, let me let me introduce you real fast, Kelly. Sorry, okay. I'm trying to do too many things at once. All right. So our next presentation is. Um, Kelly Ogden Schutz, tell me if I said that wrong, will be presenting on behalf of herself and her co-authors, John Marcotte and Sarah Rush, who are also here with us today, on deposit options to enhance the FAIR principles. Kelly is the data project assistant for DSDR. Her responsibilities include user support, outreach, and reporting. Kelly holds a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University. She has experience working with data related to youth, STEM, and influencing factors in election studies. Kelly worked for the American National Election Studies at the Institute for Social Research from 2004 to 2008 and returned to ISR in 2015, transferring to the DSDR project. Um, all right, well, thank you for joining us today, Kelly, and I'll let you take it away. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about deposit options to enhance the FAIR principles. So research data repositories must adhere to the FAIR principles to in making data uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as a minimum standard rather than a goal. In addition, repositories should strive to make uh, data discoverable rather than just findable. Discoverable data turns up in many kinds of searches via context such as topics, uh, authors, and funders. The keys to data discoverability are a thorough metadata and effective search engines. Metadata is also important for making data accessible and interoperable. Um, wonderful. Uh, throughout today's presentation, uh, I'm gonna refer to research data specifically as information designed to produce aggregate results such as summary statistics summary statistics and regression coefficients. Uh, these aggregate results must meet disclosure protection thresholds, such as cell sizes for tables, sample sizes for regressions, and other specified conditions. While research data may contain information about individuals and organizations, they are not particularly intended for identifying individuals and organizations. Research data are sometimes available from multiple sources. One good example is ongoing studies where multiple uh, with multiple waves, uh, which often provide data access through the project website. Uh, this can create a challenge for projects which wanna make the data findable by researchers uh, from sources outside of the project website. Most repositories for research data have only one method of deposit. That is, the repository hosts the only accessible version of the data and documentation, including the codebook or data dictionary. These repositories then make the data available through public download or through a restricted access mechanism. It is essential that repositories must adhere to the FAIR principles. To ensure that we're all on the same page, the FAIR principles are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. A key goal of any repository is making data, research data discoverable. Discoverable is an enhanced version of the findable principle. A digital object identifier is necessary 
uh, makes and making data findable, but is not necessarily sufficient for making it discoverable. Discoverability enables searches by title, source, author, and topic, as well as by variables and question texts. In addition, uh, a discoverable system allows uh, researchers to compare search results to ascertain differences and similarities. ICPSR is one of the largest repositories of research data. In addition, it has a catalog of research data as well as a variables database. Uh, researchers are able to search for research data by topics or variables. Uh, additionally, uh, ICPSR has uh, online analysis and exploration, as well as maintaining a bibliography of data related uh, publications. Uh, the bibliography helps researchers build on um, on <clears throat> previous work, excuse me. Uh, with the goals of uh, FAIR and discoverability in mind, the Data Sharing for Demographic Research uh, Project, DSDR, at ICPSR has expanded its deposit options. DSDR is funded by the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Uh, DSDR fo uh, data focuses on maternal and child health, life course, and international comparisons. DSDR has developed four deposit options to enhance discoverability. While many repositories have are only able to intake data, DSDR also ingests metadata. The four deposit options are standard, mirror, extensive metadata, and study descriptor. Standard is the most common type of study deposit, or if deposit, excuse me, in which the data are deposited exclusively with one repository. With a DSDR standard deposit, for example, we are in the position to add the most value to the data with enhanced options, such as online analysis, a bibliography of data-related publications, and data guides. Uh, DSDR only provides restricted access via this type of deposit because Administering data use agreements across multiple sources undermines protections for human subjects. Uh, however, restricted data use agreement language and data security plans can vary across repositories. Mirror deposit is the option used for making data available uh, uh, through multiple repositories. Uh, each repository has the exact same data and documentation, and one repository is designated as the primary, while other repositories mirror the primary. Uh, a mirror deposit is public access only precisely because of the problems of administering restricted data access, uh, data use agreements across multiple sources. A mirror deposit enhances the findable, accessible, and interoperable uh, attributes of data. Because the data is available in multiple uh, locations, the data is more findable and accessible. Moreover, precisely because of the uh, mirroring between repositories, the data and metadata have to be highly interoperable. Extensive metadata deposits are for situations where the data and deposit are available from another repository. Metadata about studies and variables incorporated uh, can be incorporated into multiple repository catalogs. This is ideal for ongoing studies with multiple waves where data are available from a project website, such as discussed earlier, uh, but where the project wants to increase the findability of the data. This type of deposit enables DSDR to make data it does not host discoverable through searches of topics, variables, and funders in the ICPSR catalog and variables database. Uh, moreover, ICPSR presents search results in a way that researchers can search and compare studies and variables. 
uh, I, this <clears throat> an extensive metadata deposit enhances the findable and interoperable aspects of the data. Finally, there's the study descriptor deposit. While the data and documentation are available from another source, the deposit includes a script description of the study and the type of data. Metadata about the study can be incorporated into other repository catalogs and researchers can search and compare studies. Uh, so this type of deposit enhances the findable aspect of data. Study descriptor deposits enabled DSDR to make studies with diverse types of data discoverable through the ICPSR catalog, such as genomics data and brain images hosted in other repositories. These four types of deposits allow DSDR to promote the discoverability and accessibility of all types of data and studies, as well as catalog more data than it hosts. A replete catalog is essential for enhancing the FAIR principles. So as you can see here, there's a short uh, summary table that talks about which uh, deposit option uh, sort of accentuates which type of, uh, or which attributes of the FAIR principles. And then this table uh, sort of highlights uh, by deposit option, sort of the extras that are added in um, as well. The deposit options are dependent on the interoperability of metadata standards. Metadata standards vary by academic discipline and type of data. ICPSR is a leader in the data di documentation initiative and DDI version two is the current ICPSR metadata schema. Uh, for metadata, repositories also employ other standards, uh, such as those listed, he listed here. Harmonizing metadata elements is an ongoing challenge. Um, a key goal of any repository is uh, to make the data discoverable because discoverability is increasingly important. As data repositories are tasked with accommodating a growing variety of data types, the situation is a challenge as no single repository can manage all types of data. However, repositories want to analyze, or however, researchers want to analyze these different types of data for the same project. By sharing data and metadata, data repositories can facilitate the FAIR principles in support of these goals. Data archives may comprise either data repositories and catalogs or just catalogs. Research data catalogs, such as the one at ICPSR, are essential for making data discoverable since catalogs are the foundation for searches. Mirror extensive metadata and study descriptors deposits enhance the discoverability of research data by expanding where data are cataloged beyond the hosting locations alone. This is our contact information uh, and thank you so much for your time. And I would be happy to take any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing, but I can of course restart if you want. Do we have any questions for Kelly? Mr. Marcotte. Um, so I, I actually have a question. Uh, so I actually have a couple questions, but I'll start with one. Um, so I was wondering how you handle DOIs in uh, the mirror option for, for data sets, data deposits. So like, uh, are there multiple DOIs assigned to that data set? Um, if the data is located in two different repositories, right? So if the data is stored in DSDR, but then it's also in another location, are there two separate DOIs for that data set or um, how's that that handled kind of when it comes to identifiers? I'm going to let, to my knowledge, there's one, but I'm going to let John Marcotte answer that yeah, question. Let, let me jump in here really, <laughs> really quickly. Um, <laughs> Kelly, thank you for, for presenting for us. Um, the, um, usually the DOI po points to the primary. That makes sense. And so you guys would have the like, Oh, just a link out to the DOI as the primary in the metadata record if it was yeah we could data. do that and okay. and it the the whole idea behind a mirror deposit is just to make it easier for people to to download the data 
for instance, we, as an example, we have some data that we were just talking with a researcher who wants to deposit data from work they're doing in South America. Um, and they would like to make the data available through both repositories in North America and in South America to facilitate people downloading. Gotcha, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. Um, any, any other questions from the audience? Okay, great. Um, just in a brief res uh, related uh, note to your uh, question about DOIs, I would highly recommend, if you haven't looked at it, to go check out the poster session from yesterday about uh, best practices relating to DOIs, uh, also presented by uh, the bibliography team at ICPSR. It was presented in the 5 p.m. session. Uh, I was talking about the need for more nuance within DOIs uh, to differentiate between uh, when a DOI relates to data and uh, uh, citations that actually relate to using the data itself versus citations where some, maybe it's a mention or a reference to a code book or a questionnaire use. Um, but it's but it's a highly good, uh, useful poster and, and worth re looking at. Are there any other questions? Yep, one more, thanks. Sure. Um, good talk, thank you. And always always good to hear about more um, data access options. My question is particular about particularly about the um, enhanced metadata um, option. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, do you do you check those links to see if that data remain available and accessible for download? If you do that review, how often? And if the data aren't available, what do you do? Do you decatalog that record or do you mark it in some way to indicate that that's really no longer live and available data? Thanks. Well, we always hope they tell us. <laughs> they frequently don't. <laughs> uh, John, uh, uh, would you like to address what the specific procedures uh, are? Sure. Um, the, first of all, the, the challenge of broken links is, in, in in a general issue, is a is a is a constant struggle for us. So um, we're we're doing periodic. Um, I I would like to say we do it a couple of times a year. Um, where we go through and look for broken links and try to verify what's, what's going on. Um, we don't get notified automatically if there's a broken link. Um, we like to have, we have good relationships with our depositors and people doing things, but sometimes we do have to prompt them. So at any given time, there may be a link. We make our best effort not to have broken links, but it, again, it depends on people People telling us. The whole point of the extensive metadata um, deposit for, from our perspective is to try and make it so people can search for data elements. And when I say data elements, I mean variables, question text, things that help people find the data. Um, ideally, what, and this is part of what our funder NICHD would like, is for they would like to tell, tell researchers, if you're looking for data, come to DSTR, come to ICPSR, and we will help you discover the data. Where the data may be from there may be an issue. That, excuse me, may not, may not be an issue. It may not be at ICPSR. This is important, particularly for, say, if you're looking for data. And let me give two examples of, of, of data that ICPSR does not host and DSTR is not host. If you're interested in doing aging research, if you know you want to use the Health and Retirement Survey, which is a large survey out of the Institute for Social Research, then you can go directly to the HRS website. If you're interested in using another large survey, again, from the Institute for Social Research, the Panel Study for Income Dynamics, you can go directly there. But if you don't know that you want either of those data sets, but are looking for variables that may be included in a data set and want to be able to compare what's available in HRS versus what's available in PSID, that's where an extensive meta metadata deposit helps us facilitate that. Thank you, John. Any other questions? Question. It, I, I'm monitoring the online chat as well, but that, that's there's no questions in there. Um, I, I guess I'm a little confused about the interoperable, particularly around the extended metadata. Um, I, I, I say, well, I think I can see how it helps you find it you know, more effectively and for discovery purposes. That's a really good thing. 
that does it really help you interoperate if you, if the if the data is not there or have you got mechanisms to allow you to get to to the variables that you're looking for so that you can actually interoperate them the the interoperable part of part of it is is mostly trying to make it so that we can catalog the across different metadata standards um, the the idea is that if you can find it and we can put a link put the appropriate link in you can you can get to it but the interoperability part of the data is really related to to trying to make the the it, it catalogable the metadata inter, interoperable in this in this context thank you any other questions from the audience because i actually have one more question <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm just interested in the workflow for these different types of deposits. Is it kind of like a researcher goes to the system and they select what types the most appropriate for their data or study that's going to be included in DSDR? Or is that something you guys kind of facilitate and have conversations with them about? Um, so it seems like that could be relatively complicated when you have these various different types of deposits coming into the system. Again, we 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 offer these different options. Again, I, I have to fall back a little bit in terms of our mission from, from our funder, which is to make all NICHD data discoverable. Um, so we're constantly doing outreach. Well, if you can't give us the data, if you can't deposit the data with us, um, can you at least give us metadata that allows us to, to do things? Um, again, the examples I gave you, uh, uh, HRS, PSID, Fragile Families at Princeton, uh, various places who want, want to make the data dis discoverable. So we make the case to them that they really need to help enhance the discoverability of their data. That so that, sense, that yeah. is doing, doing outreach. When people come to us with different options, again, we were just discussing this week with a researcher who has data from South America. Um, potentially how a mirror deposit would potentially work because of the desire to, to, to work with it. But most often when people come in, they're generally coming in to do a standard deposit. The, the other types of deposit are usually where we're going out and trying to say, hey, we'd like to add your data to our catalog. Would you, will you allow us to do that? One thing we don't do, and this is always a challenge, is we don't go around and do any kind of data scraping. We don't go around and put data in our catalog without the permission of the PIs on the, on the project. So we find a data that, that might be useful to our community, to our research community, we'll contact them and give them some options. But there's no, like we don't try to scrape metadata without permission. I, I haven't a separate follow-up on uh, connecting two questions from before the the mirror um version is it an actual mirror or do you do extra processing on it and the reason i'm that i'll preempt the second half of my question is um there would be an argument for putting a DIY against a reprocessed um data set because it's not the same thing yeah at that point so is, is it a straight mirror and a, a direct copy or is it actually a value added or you know a, a, a you know some some editing done to the data itself that actually would make it you know quite reasonable i think to be you know, yeah, putting another I, idea against it no that's a very good point and and what at least again i my perspective is i'm not talking about just icpsr in general mostly about my particular project is that um i have the strong view that if you get, if data are available, it's like going to a library. I don't expect to get different books at, from different libraries. They're just accessible at, at different libraries. If the data are really changed, then they need to have it appended that this is the ICPSR version or the DSDR version, and it will require a new DOI. Um, we, for instance, an example is we mirror at ICPSR some Eurobarometer studies. Okay, and the understanding is that we actually have copies of what what the Eurobarometer studies are. If it's not a mirror deposit, then 
it gets tricky. And it also gets tricky from a, a standpoint of uh, academia, which is that someone says, I use this data. Well, which rendition of the data did you use? Did you use the ICPSR rendition? Did you use the Dataverse rendition? Um, so I think it's important, especially when you have data available from multiple sources, that we're both clear that are they the same or not. We strive, at least the framework that we've developed, is that a mirror deposit uh, really is a mirror. Great, thank you. All right, well, um, join me in thanking our presenters, John, John and Kelly. I'll give, give a shout out also to Sarah Rush, who is our, our third author. Oh, okay, still working. All right, so give me a second while we switch it up and go to our final presentation. Great, thank and you. Thanks, thank you. All right, Heather and Abigail, are you there? I don't know which one of you is sharing your slides, but you can go ahead and start sharing. Okay, I, this is Heather. I'm gonna share. Okay. Um, let me just move some things around. Okay, can you see our slides? We can. All right, let me quickly introduce you, Heather. Um, so our final presentation is from Heather Coates and Abigail Gobin. They will be presenting Shifting into Data Governance Roles, Encounters of Three Data Librarians, and they will be introducing themselves today. So thank you very much. And you can go ahead and get started, Heather. Thanks so much. Abigail, just let me know when to advance. All right, good morning. So um, thank you. It is very early here. I'm joining you this morning from Chicago and Heather from Indianapolis. So this morning, we're going to be talking about shifting into data governance roles, encounters of three data librarians. Um, I'm Abigail Gobin. I am the data librarian and a data policy advisor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, we're also speaking on behalf this morning of our colleague, Kristen Briney, who is the biology librarian at Caltech. And our, of course, my other co-presenter this morning is Heather Coates, who is data librarian and data steward at Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis. Okay, Heather, next slide, please. Great, thank you. All right, so this morning we're gonna go through a little a couple different things here. We're going to talk a little bit about an introduction to data governance. How are we defining data governance and what does that mean for our institutions and how are we defining it for the framework of this particular talk? We then want to talk a little bit about our own experiences getting involved at our unique institutions here spanning three different institutions in the United States. And then the value and opportunities for getting involved in data governance at your institution. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, there are many definitions of data governance, most of which come out of a business or um, industry context. And so the three that we've listed here all speak to different but important aspects of research data governance in higher education. Um, the definition from Olivesrud, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is nice and concise and is a good place to start for folks who um, may be new to the concept. So I often use this when I'm speaking to researchers. The definition from the Data Governance Institute is helpful for describing the scope of data governance work, particularly when it intersects with the work of other units within higher ed like IT and information security folks. Um, and finally, the last definition on this slide, which comes out of the Indiana University 
data management council charge for that group um, frames data governance as a quality control discipline. So many definitions um, tend to emphasize the work during, done during the active use of the data by the organization, but they give very little thought to long-term issues such as curation, preservation, and eventual data discard. So for much of the administrative data that institutions have, Retention schedules are based on legal requirements and data are discarded as soon as possible to minimize risk. That same approach doesn't work for research data, as you all know. So this is another area where governing research data really needs to be distinguished from administrative or operational data. So there, <clears throat> excuse me. There are a variety of roles of data governance in higher education, and this is to expand a bit on what Heather has described as those preliminary definitions. We can start with those definitions, but then we need to figure out what is the role or what are these obligations that data governance plays in higher education institutions. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it is one that helps us to begin to frame what it is that we're doing. So with each of these, like thinking a lot of this, a lot of this comes back to compliance. We think about ensuring that compliance requirements are met. And this is often where governance starts. We are focused on, we need to comply with a federal policy, a state policy, a funder policy. So we often start from a place of compliance. The other thing that comes up most frequently is to minimize risk. Rather th whether that is risk to the institution, risk to a research participant, uh, ris risk of a research investigator, it will It'll vary based on who it is that is concerned about the risk, but there's always worry about data breach, unauthorized access, misuse of data. Other considerations are protecting intellectual property. Data we are hearing here and in other situations is an asset, and there is increased concerns about data licensing, return on investment, getting value for data, data is its own scholarly object. So these three pieces kind of come from that legal side and is often where we start. But there are other parts to data governance in higher ed as well. By setting up these frameworks, and I really love the initial presentation from this session, so it was talking about enabling collaboration, having consistent language where everyone agrees what access means and what is required for someone to get access. This can really facilitate collaboration. That then adds value of the data, by the data, with the data. It improves data as that scholarly object to assign governance and assign access and reuse and policies. It enables and facilitates long-term stewardship in terms of both providing frameworks, but also providing obligations. Who has the obligations for that stewardship? To then balance the rights of researchers, community partners, funders, and then identifying who everybody's partners are, both within the university and also beyond. Next slide. Okay, so, excuse me, data governance generally tends to be described and operationalized at the level of the individual institution or organization. Um, but as we all know, governing research data requires that we balance institutional priorities with those of funders, those of the investigators, the research community more broadly. Um, and governing research data is truly a community effort. Um, researchers often encounter obstacles or friction when they try to share their data. And in many cases, or at least in, in, in some of the most um, common um, interactions that I have, those are related to data governance decisions or gaps in policy and process. 
And in part, this is because the boundaries of research data governance are unclear. So one of the reasons that we um, advocate and we have found engaging in this topic so useful is that we hope to bring some useful language and awareness to the conversation so that investigators, those engaged in institutional governance, those engaged in community governance and, and funding agencies, et cetera, recognize that we are often not naming the source or the, um, the shared responsibility that we have to help researchers navigate their responsibilities and roles to the best of their ability. Um, so next, what we're going to do, um, and I'm going to fingers crossed that this works, we're going to hear from Kristen about her experience at Caltech. Um, and I'm going to click on this and hopefully the sound will share. Let us know if you do not hear the sound. I've been at Caltech since the fall of 2019, and while we had established data services in the library prior to my arrival, we haven't had a unified approach to dealing with research data across campus units. Part of this is because Caltech and bureaucracy go together like oil and water, to use a science metaphor. Caltech has traditionally been acquisitive when it comes to intellectual property produced at the university, but there is no guidance on the university's roles or responsibilities around research data. This poses challenges for everything from providing guidance on data retention to licensing research data sets. In 2020, the library and IT worked together on a report to look at the challenge that is the ownership and stewardship of research data on campus. One of the final report's recommendations was that Caltech needed a research data policy and data governance. Complicating the work on the report's recommendation was the announcement at the end of 2020 of the new National Institutes of Health NIH data management and sharing policy. This policy will go into effect at the beginning of 2023 and will require coordination between the library, IT, the Office of Research, the Institutional Review Board, IRB, grants administrators, and of course, researchers themselves. The library made a conscious choice to focus on NIH policy implementation instead of the report's recommendations for a research data policy, knowing that working toward the NIH policy will improve relationships and probably highlight the need for data governance and data policy at the institution. After many meetings about the upcoming NIH data policy, I have hope that we'll be able to make some data governance work happen, but the effort is currently in developing stronger relationships across campus. We're very much in the beginning of our data governance journey, so it'll be interesting to see how everything develops in the next few years. Okay, and next we'll hear from Abigail. Okay, so um, again, I'm at the University of Illinois Chicago, and the university library had colleagues who were interested in data services before I arrived in 2010. But it was really with the National Science Foundation and when that data management plan requirement dropped that in 2011, it really set us off on the path that we are still on today and we're continuing to evolve and react from. And for 10 years, I've been working with colleagues to develop data services, including kind of the standard data management plan services, establishing a graduate course, and identifying across campus a lot of partners and opportunities for data collaborations. Currently, I'm split in my role. So I'm serving both as our first data services librarian. I'm not the only person with data work that I do, but I'm the first one with that full title. And I also serve as the policy advisor in the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. And my target there and the work that I do there is focusing on the impacts of policy and coordinating response to federal policy, draft guidance, requests for information, trying to get ahead of data governance requirements that are coming at us and prepare our institution and be part of that conversation for what lies ahead. Right now, we're working on one that's related to sensitive data sharing. And so I have meetings about that later today. For UIC, data governance has historically been driven by our information technology division. 
that has begun to significantly evolve, but that is where we are coming from. It's a history of focusing on this from IT. For about seven years, we've had an IT governance or leadership council, depending on what year you were on it. And there are different subgroups that focused on research, education, infrastructure, and other areas to identify challenges and advocate for solutions. And a lot of these have been kind of preliminary overarching data governance. There is interest and efforts to form a specific data governance group in, within this infrastructure. Um, but as Kristen mentioned, the NIH policy drastically sped up many of our needs for governance and communication. UIC is very much an NIH funded institution. We have all the health science colleges. And so that has brought together very actively the kind of standard governance partners, which is the research office, IT, and the library. And in my role, I'm two of the three of those. So it's really a team effort right now. And while we're still determining exactly how we move forward, we're really integrating those three perspectives and trying to evolve our data governance forward to meet the oncoming requirements. Next slide. Okay, so before I um, uh, share the journey at IU, I, <laughs> I also have to explain a bit about our um, where I sit. Uh, so Indiana University is a system and I am on the IUPUI campus of that system, um, which has the main um, campus for the, med the IU School of Medicine, as well as the School of Public Health, Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. We are the urban um, health science campus, essentially, of Indiana University. So in my role as a data management librarian, I serve the IUPUI campus. Um, but in my role as a data steward, I serve the entire IU system, which is frankly confusing for lots of people. So that's why I sort of explain. Um, so that alludes to some of the complexities around how um, large, I think, universities with multiple campuses struggle to um, provide both centralized, consistent level of service while also having, you know, unit specific needs. So we'll come back to some of that a bit later. Um, but like Abigail, I started around the time um, as a librarian around the time of the NSF data management policy um, in late 2011. And during my first few years as a data librarian, I spent a lot of time learning to navigate the various research support services across the IU system. I asked a lot of questions on behalf of those I was consulting with, um, but it really wasn't until I read Kristen and Abigail's 2015 article, Do You Have an Institutional Data Policy, that I was really able to identify some of these unnamed obstacles that I've been encountering, particularly around data sharing. So much of the research on my campus involves human participants and is subject to the common rule. Um, so I started asking questions of our HIPAA privacy officer, who is a university-wide um, uh, appointment, and the health data steward, um, which has generally been the same person, and also talking to our research integrity office. Again, that group serves the entire university. Um, eventually, those conversations led to the creation of an informal working group of people who were willing to work with me to draft a comprehensive research data policy for AU. We wanted a policy that addressed data ownership, storage, retention, management, sharing, and preservation. Um, and the conversations turned out to be a great venue for us to learn from each other, to understand the various perspectives, um, and balance some of the, the requirements and the obligations that we, we um, each sort of were aware of and brought to the table. And it helped us to get a glimpse into these other perspectives and how complicated how complex navigating some of these decisions really can be. Um, however, it was only after we'd been meeting for several months that our chief data officer learned of the group, and I learned that um, there was an existing data governance structure. It turns out that IU already had a policy um, that defined research data as inst institutional data in most cases. And this policy um, is called DMO1. It's been around since 1991. 
the problem is that very few researchers understood and interpreted it to include research data. So in early 2017, I was appointed the first IU data steward for research data um, and began to figure out how research data governance can fit into an existing mature data governance program. Over the past five years, I've learned about the institutional responsibilities for governing research data and done my best to advocate for policies, processes, and resources that make it easier for researchers to jointly steward research data with the institution and their funders. Um, and as I said before, this really is a community effort that takes a highly coordinated approach, which we are working on improving. So as we have had these conversations and spoken with each other, Abigail, Kristen, and I have um, sort of identified some of the gaps that are common to our institutions, but also in our conversations with others seem to be similar. Um, and, and I should just say, we found tremendous value in engaging with the various stakeholders at our institutions. Um, this is a really rapidly evolving and dynamic and complex situation that depends on institutional context, local and state laws, in addition to federal and international regulations. And frankly, um, uh, each institution kind of interprets some of these things differently. So as we know, human subjects offices have different perspectives perhaps on um, different issues. And so that, that brings in um, different nuances to the institutional conversation. So some of the things that we've identified as gaps that may apply, and this is probably more applicable to the US and higher ed, um, is a lack of clarity about really who is responsible for the various facets of research data governance. This is in part due to the dominance of the IT perspective. And particularly at my institution and many institutions, the IT security perspective. We believe the data governance conversations need to be more representative of all the stakeholders, including the researchers themselves, libraries, research administrators who are reviewing and executing agreements, general counsel and departmental administrators. When policies and processes don't reflect the reality of research, people often bypass them, which introduces a whole other set of issues. Um, there's also a need to differentiate data governance by data domains, particularly so that research specific terminology and context can be appropriately integrated into those policies, processes, guidance and resources. And that is something that I've, I come into, um, I confront on a daily basis in my role. Um, because we have many mature processes that work very well for administrative data, they don't always work well for research data and it can be challenging and frankly time consuming to articulate when and why that happens. Additionally, research data governance is subject to rapidly changing external policies and pressures. As we've alluded to, the NIH uh, data management sharing policy that will take effect next January is a huge driver for many of us. Um, but local policies, processes, and bureaucracy that are associated with information and data security often simply exclude issues that are relevant to research. And do, in doing so, they pose additional obstacles for researchers. So we sometimes see projects held up when the protocol raises questions or concerns that are not clearly in the scope of research administration, research compliance, or IT. Uh, this lack of clarity and subsequent delays are really frustrating to researchers, particularly when they're on tight deadlines and the purpose of data governance has not been clearly communicated to them. So finally, uh, there's also lots of unknown unknowns. Um, and in many cases, institutions have not really adequately invested in data governance to answer key but basic questions like, what data do we have? Where is it? How long should we keep it and who should have access? Um, so 
We don't have answers to those things, um, but in case you're interested in learning more about data governance at your institution, we have some recommendations for getting started. Uh, do some investigating to find out if your institution has a data governance body, who is represented in that body, what their scope of authority is, and what processes exist. Once you have a basic idea for that, reach out to connect with someone new to learn more. Um, in most cases, we have found that the folks who are doing this work are almost invisible and underappreciated. And so they are happy to talk and, um, and to share their expertise and to get help, frankly, and grappling with some of these issues. Um, and finally, you know, just having a conversation about your questions, asking these folks what they consider to be the priorities, challenges, gaps, etc., is really powerful. Um, because in our experience, um, and as we've seen, I think, through many of the other sort of more community-oriented stewardship efforts, it takes takes years of investment and relationships before things begin to change and momentum is built. So that is all for us. We are happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I am going to stop the share. Are there any questions for Heather, Abigail, and Abigail? Anything online? Yeah. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> I'm full of questions today. Um, so I, I will say just uh, from my perspective where I'm sitting at Duke, I'm seeing some similar similar challenges as well as opportunities. And I was wondering, um, you know, a lot of this comes down to different, as you said, different individuals and stakeholders on campus sit in different places and have different priorities um, and different perspectives on this topic. Uh, what strategies have you found to be effective in kind of bridging those conversations, particularly, you know, as data librarians, as we're approaching the, the urge to make data more open and more accessible and, you know, these policies around data sharing when you're talking to individuals that are very much focused on the risk and the compliance and that kind of institutional perspective of um, really protecting and and really, you know, that 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 tension between risk and compliance versus open data sharing. So I'd be very interested in what strategies you maybe have found effective there. Oh, isn't that the question? Um, <laughs> if, if I had an easy answer for that one, um, I'd probably be making a lot more money than I am right now. Um, so I think acknowledging that there are those tensions is a huge priority and that goes a long way when you say things like yes we cannot make everything immediately available and immediately open how do we do this responsibly um starting from the place of everyone wants to honor research participants um secure data protecting, you know, endangered species and things like that, recognizing those things. Um, we, we want to recognize that, but we also want to value open and sharing. And I think it comes back to, it's that cliched, it's, it's a bit cliched at this point, but it's as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, and I think that's kind of where we, we end up coming back to. Um, I think we also have to think about what is realistic risk um, and what is also possible in terms of technological advances now and what's coming at us. Um, I'm fighting this or struggling with this a lot at my institution because human subject data can be de-identified and then you can share that data and it's not human subject data and it's no longer subject to our IRB. But we all know that recombination of data, AI, machine learning, all of these different things can easily lead to re-identification. So while I am an enormous advocate for open and sharing, um, I also recognize the downstream harm. So, I'm often the person coming in saying, I want it to be open, I want it to be accessible. Have you considered the downstream harm? Um, so I think as long as you are 
thoughtful about it and just really raising both both those issues and thinking all the way through how data gets used. It's it's not an easy solution for any kind of data, but most people are able to see both sides. Um, and I think my even my head of security recognizes the benefit of data sharing and we want to share data and we want to engage. So yeah, hard question. <laughs> Great, thank you. Other yeah, I'll just, oh, sorry. I'll just jump on that and just say that, it, so this is gonna speak to the differences in our roles and our institutions. Um, for me, people are often willing to listen when I come to them and say, I'm, I'm working with researchers and they are re really struggling with this particular process and this particular use case. And so can we talk about, you know, why this may not be working or how can we help them? Um, because in many cases, you know, I, information security folks are trained to look at things through a particular lens. And it's not until we get a variety of perspectives at the table that we are able to start to talk about the balance between risk and benefit, right? And so I think bringing really specific scenarios and use cases is powerful, but also being willing to to learn and listen to other people is a powerful way to start the conversation. None of us have all the answers or maybe any answers. We, it's really something that we have to come to together. Okay, we have a question online uh, um, from, uh, it's from John. So John, do you actually want to unmute and uh, ask? Yeah, I, can un I can unmute. Let me, let me start my video so I'm not just a blank um, circumstance. Oh my God, maybe I will mute. Um, I can see myself on the screen. So it was for, for Heather and, and her teams, you mentioned about tension with IT. Um, do you have an example of where IT's sense of security, how it differs from the researcher requirement? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Short answer is yes, sorry. There's a couple of ways in which um, I have found some fundamental differences. So uh, one is that, um, access and sharing are not the same, right? So access during the active conduct of a project is typically what our IT administrators think about. They don't so much think about sharing downstream. Like it's just, it's not something that those system folks are really um, aware of. And so I have been trying to tease apart the language in our policies and our processes because um, those are two different conversations. The other piece of it is that the, the starting premise for a lot of our, our research data is that how can we share it? How can we make it available to others, which that is not the starting premise for much of our operational or admin data as an institution. Um, so those perspectives influence the sort of default stance for IT and security um, as well as basic things like data classification. So we have our default data classification um, for administrative data is university internal. Well, that doesn't make sense for research data. <laughs> there are few cases in which we would make research data available to anyone with the institute, within the institution, but not anyone outside. So those are a few sort of specific examples. The rest of them get very much into like that the institutional data governance model, blah, blah, blah. But I'm some of that stuff is online and I'm happy to share more if that's of interest. Great, thank you. Thank you, Heather. I was gonna just share two, two examples for us on the other side, is that oftentimes when we're, I'm dealing with IT folks, they don't understand inferential disclosure risk. Yes. They, well, this is a limited data set from a HIPAA standpoint, Mm -hmm. Therefore, why can't you just share it? Yes. Um, and then the, the second issue that comes up for us a lot is at least a lot of the protocols that we have have to do with uh, the internet and how the internet's arranged to things. So if you talk to the typical IT person and they say, where is the best place to store my research data? They say, our server, which is, which is wonderful and secure. However, um, for a lot of our data security plans, that's the exact opposite of what's allowed. 
because you're not allowed to put it on a server where you can copy the data to various sources. You can put it in an enclave, but you can't necessarily just put it on a server. So there's a language issue that kind of, um, because from a standpoint of, of IT, if you put it on the server, they're protecting the integrity of the data and they can control the permissions. They're less concerned about some of these other issues. Yes, and we have, so there are groups within our, we have a very large IT organization, our research technologies group and our cybersecurity folks get that very much, but you're right, the at the frontline IT folks don't necessarily, yeah. There's, I think there's a lot of work that can be done around the language that we use because, you know, this, the stewardship conversation is much broader and more long term and the way in which we define terminology and those conversations is very different than how it is used in an IT focused conversation. Okay, so I think we have one more quick question. Is that right, uh, Steve? I just want to quickly highlight some work that's happening in Australia that might be of interest. Um, there's uh, this is a, I mentioned the ARDC who's funding our our project. Mm -hmm. Um, they're actually got a program that's called the Institutional Underpinnings Program. I've just dropped a link into the chat here, which is trying to address some of those common language, common framework problems across the, the institutional life cycle. Um, they've just published the first draft version of that framework uh, and you know, keen to hear feedback. So it just might be some uh, something you're interested in reading and engaging with. Great. Will you also put that in the WOVA chat, uh, Steve, so that... I can have it for later because so, <laughs> I'm very interested in this topic myself. So, um, all right, well, we are at time. Thank you so much. Join me in thanking our presenters one last time. Really, really interesting stuff. And um, now we are headed to lunch. And um, thank you again, everyone that joined us online and we will see you later. Bye.